She was like a Hollywood star. She was perfect, flawless, and there was almost a sort of aura of goldenness around her. Diana would have celebrated her 40th birthday this year. For most of us, life is supposed to begin at 40. But for Diana, her life was cut short. Too soon for most, too late for a few. Fairy tales are supposed to have happy endings. The Honourable Diana Frances Spencer was born on the 1st of July, 1961. She was an immediate disappointment to her parents. There are several preoccupations that mar the existence of any British noble family. You're always worried about appearances, you're always worried about money, of not selling off any land, and above all else, you must produce male heirs. With two daughters already, Tensions rose between Johnny Spencer and his young wife Frances when Diana turned out not to be a David. I think Diana's witnessing of her parents' perpetual rows, uh, arguments, anger, um, they were both volatile characters, Frances and Johnny, uh, and I think that it is fairly evident that the children were witness to the many rows that went on between the couple. Three years later, a boy was born. Duty was done. The Spencer line secured, and the marriage fell apart. Diana, aged six, saw her mother storm out of the house, and her father hit the bottle. Her brother Charles, the heir, became the focus, and her elder sisters were dispatched to boarding school. Diana blamed herself for the breakup of the family. If only she had been a boy. Well, right away, it would have had a very powerful impact. Uh, I think there was about three years differential between her and Charles in terms of age. And so she grew up, so the, the formative years, her very early years, she was reminded constantly, uh, probably subconsciously, there was always that kind of feeling I'm sure she got, that she wasn't the right sex, the right gender. In the bitter custody battle that followed, Diana's mother was betrayed by her own mother, Diana's grandmother. Ruth Lady Fomoy, the Queen Mother's best friend, testified against her own daughter apropos of custody of the children because she was such a snob that she wanted these children brought up in the Earl part of the family rather than her own part of the family, unbelievably. In 1971, Diana followed her sisters to West Heath boarding school. If life at home had been unbearable without her mother, at least at school, Diana was happy. The academic side never interested her, but she was an excellent swimmer and a gifted pianist. Diana spent most of her time reading Barbara Cartland novels and disappearing into a world of make-believe. There are all these stories told that Diana said she was going to be a princess one day or said she was going to marry somebody significant. I think um, all teenage girls have such dreams. At school, the first signs of Diana's distress over her parents' marriage failure began to surface. The fact that Diana started her symptoms of bulimia when she went to boarding school is also actually quite telling, because people who develop symptoms of bulimia tend to come from very troubled backgrounds, usually rife with divorce or some other kind of conflict, and they use bulimia as a way of sort of developing their self-esteem. This is a way that they feel that they can develop their self-esteem and also to over overcome difficulties with painful emotions. Diana's troubled emotional state was made worse in 1975 when her grandfather died. Her father, Johnny, became the eighth Earl Spencer. He was now a wealthy, titled man and divorced a prize catch. It was Rain, Countess of Dartmouth, mother of four and daughter of Diana's favorite author, Barbara Cartland, who hooked him. The young Diana hated her. She was a wonderful example of the wicked stepmother. 
She moves in, uh, she adores Johnny, or shall we say she at least adores his position and his title, and she is absolutely determined to make him hers, even if that means alienating the children. They all used to, to sing together, rain, rain, go away, never come back another day. So they obviously didn't get on with her at all. Uh, and they thought that what well, she had done, she had interposed between the father and, and the, their relationships with him. After West Heath, and not wanting to be at home with Acid Rain, her stepmother, Diana moved in with her sister Sarah in London. Initially, there was friction as the young sister cramped Sarah's style. Flatmate Lucinda Craig Harvey observed, Diana hero worshipped Sarah, but she treated her like a doormat. After a while, however, there was a realization that Diana might have a future. I think there certainly was jealousy on behalf of those two sisters, but at the same time, um, they were looking for a dynastic alliance. They desperately wanted to see whether they couldn't get Diana alongside Prince Charles. Diana's sister Sarah had a brief relationship with Prince Charles. It had not been a success, but maybe they could catch him with their younger sister. They knew that Diana was absolutely the right girl in the right place at the right time, and so they pushed her forward. Diana had met Charles many times as a child, but it was at a party given by the de Passes in July 1980 where Charles was reintroduced to the now 19 years old Diana. I think that it was a little bit more than coincidence, but not totally prearranged, so somewhere between half and half, but the de Passes were, were great friends of Prince Philip's, and I think that they thought it would be nice for Diane to meet Charles and Charles to meet Diana. Charles, 31, had recently bought Highgrove as if symbolically saying to the world's women he was ready to settle. He'd always said, oh, I don't think I should get married before I'm 30. So once he turned 30, the heat was on. He had to find a wife. And when Diana came along, she was so perfect in every way, so it seemed. There were restrictions on his choice by antique, uh, outrageous statutes. He couldn't marry outside the Protestant faith, etc. Uh, he couldn't marry, as custom and habit had it at the time, a girl with what was called a past. In fact, Diana's uncle gave a press conference to prove that she was a virgin, which was one of the most extraordinary events I've ever attended. I think the fact that Diana had had very few boyfriends uh, and there was very little that the press could dig up about her uh, was certainly in her favour, and she came from the right sort of class, if you like. Charles was attractive, and they started dating. Diana's family was thrilled. When Diana joined Charles at a concert at the Royal Albert Hall, her chaperone for the evening was her grandmother, Ruth, Lady Fomoy. Ruth, Lady Fomoy, must have sat in the car and thought that she was the cat who had the cream. But now, at long last, she was going further and further up the hierarchy and her granddaughter was going to be the future Queen of England. Wonderful. The relationship developed and, as with most inquisitive girls, Diana asked Charles about his previous girlfriends. She heard a name that would come to haunt her for the rest of her life. He sort of told her that Camilla was the one that he'd really cared about, and this festered in her mind. And he, he should never have told her that. Um, so this Camilla bubble started to get bigger and bigger and bigger, and I think she just blew it out of all proportion. The difficulty with Charles was that uh, really after he had um, gone to bed with and fallen in love with Camilla, uh, all other women seemed a rather pale imitation. Most in the palace considered Camilla ideal mistress material, but no more. But this was not an issue, as it was normal practice for a prince to have a mistress or two. Edward VII, Charles' great-great-grandfather, had set the precedent. He had an affair with, among others, Alice Keppel, Camilla's grandmother. As love blossomed, pressure increased on Charles to make a decision. The nation had found its fairy tale princess, and Diana had found her Prince Charming. Charles really had little choice.
Charles had been put under tremendous pressure, principally by Prince Philip and several courtiers as well who were suggesting that, you know, it was about the time he got married and produced an heir. Charles hesitated. He turned to the only woman who really understood him for advice, Camilla. She thought Diana posed no threat to her and Charles. Camilla made the biggest mistake of her life. She described Diana as the mouse. She absolutely did not see Diana Spencer coming. She hadn't got a clue as to the formidable foe that she had taken on. And Camilla was not alone. Everyone underestimated the mouse. The intriguing thing about the Diana story is the way that this gawky, uh, uncertain, shy nursery school teacher becomes the leading media celebrity of the age and knows she is as well and is prepared to use that power. It's almost like Frankenstein's beauty. By the same token, Diana underestimated the hold Camilla had on Charles. Diana saw in Charles the opportunity to build the happy family she had been deprived of as a child. She was not going to let this opportunity go. Charles Valley, Stephen Barry, commented, in all my years, I've never seen anyone as tricky or as determined as she was. Well, when Princess Diana first laid eyes on Prince Charles, right away she projected onto him this fantasy figure of the rich, wealthy person who is going to whisk her away and um, rescue her from her family situation. And this is, this is something that Diana had in her mind, her fantasy. The press pushed for Diana too. Diana sold newspapers. When the media did realize that there may be something going on between the two of them, of course, I mean, all hell broke loose. To escape the photographers, Diana once clambered down some knotted sheets at the back of her flat to sneak off to see Charles the thrill of the chase. When you are sharing a danger like that, an excitement like that, that can bring two people together. So in some ways, the media hunt of them brought Charles and Diana together. The chase also nearly drove them apart. On the 5th of November, 1980, the Mirror reported that a woman was seen joining the Prince on the Royal train parked in sidings overnight. The paper claimed it was Diana. Diana knew otherwise but said nothing. There was Prince Charming, the man who's going to be the King of England. From her point of view, it must have been easy to have convinced herself that she was in love. From Prince Charles's point of view, he had this shy, beautiful youngster who all the media had immediately fallen in love with. From his point of view, she was a catch as well. Diana may have had the right qualities to be a future queen, but she and Charles really had little in common. The problem was that Prince Charles was Radio 4 and she was Radio 1, and they stayed that way. I mean, the tragedy of it all is that she was the perfect girl for us, but she was not the perfect girl for Charles. It took six months for Diana to net her catch. On the 6th of February, 1981, Charles proposed and Diana happily accepted. The next day, Diana moved to Clarence House and had her first taste of things to come. No welcome with open arms, just a nod from a rather curt official. It was like walking into a hotel, Diana said later. What people did not know is that two days after she moved in to the Queen Mother, she moved from there to Buckingham Palace and took rooms next to Charles's rooms. I have it on the absolute first-hand account that that six months of their relationship was fantastic. They were totally together the whole time. Then on Tuesday the 24th of February 1981, they told the world they were engaged. Charles fluffed his lines. When Charles famously said whatever love means in the engagement interview, uh, the irony of course we now know is that he did know perfectly well because he was in love with Camilla Parker Bowles. With the formalities addressed, Charles went back to work leaving Diana to tackle the media. She was a natural. Diana Mania took off. At a gala for the Royal Opera House, Diana wore a black silk taffeta strapless gown with a plunging decolletage. 
Charles was almost speechless. He got out of the car and he said to all the pressmen gathered there, you'll never guess what's coming next. He was so proud of her. He thought she looked amazing. In one simple act, Diana leapt from naive little girl to glamorous superstar. No one estimated that Diana would turn from the gawky, shy little duckling into this fantastic swan. Diana, at this early stage, was really an innocent. She was an innocent abroad. She didn't know it, but she, in fact, was the bait being thrown to the sharks. Just before the wedding, Camilla took Diana to lunch. Camilla gushed over the engagement ring and quizzed Diana over whether she would hunt. When Diana said no, Camilla smiled. She and Charles would still be able to meet. Diana hoped that in the run-up to the marriage that her overwhelming love for Prince Charles would provoke him to dispatch Camilla Parker Bowles into oblivion. But as the months went by and this did not happen, the doubts must have gradually grown in her own mind. She realised too the enormity of the role, the position she was taking on. Then just five days before the wedding, Diana found some jewellery. A bracelet with a blue enamelled disc with the letters F and G entwined. Fred and Gladys, the nicknames she knew Charles and Camilla called themselves. It was a gift for Camilla. Diana exploded with rage. Charles looked on, shocked. Nothing in his upbringing had prepared him for having to face somebody who had become hysterical. And uh, his attitude towards um, that kind of behavior was really to turn his back on it. He, he just shut down. Angry and stressed, Diana wondered whether she could go through with the wedding. She had doubts, and she once said to her sister, Sarah, you know, I really need now, I want to pull out, I want to scrap the engagement. And Sarah replied, it's too late Dutch, which was the nickname, your face is on the tea towels. And so on the 29th of July, 1981, the fairy tale became reality in front of 700 million people. As Diana walked down the aisle at St Paul's, she saw Camilla. She was looking out to see where she was, to see what she was looking like, and she had in her eye a gleam of victory. I'm married to Charles, you're not. All the royals standing there as they processed down the aisle knew that this man was in love with another woman who was also standing there in the congregation, and Diana told us how she noticed Camilla and her son as she went by and thought, well, that's all over. And after the wedding came the first real opportunity for Diana to be alone with her husband. I think Charles realized on the honeymoon that he had made the biggest mistake of his life. Diana was overwrought by, and understandably so, by all the pressure and attention which had been given to her. Now she was alone with this man who was considerably older than her. They spent a lot of time sunbathing, reading, and just being in each other's company. Diana tells a slightly different story. She said she was already in the huge grips of bulimia and was rushing down to the wardroom to get buckets of ice cream. And uh, she says that Prince Charles um, read a lot and didn't pay enough attention to her. So we already got sort of kind of differing stories here. It was on board Britannia where two photos of Camilla fell out of Charles's diary. Diana demanded the truth, but Charles did not respond. Diana took his silence as an ambition of guilt. Charles saw Diana as a blank page to be written on precisely as he wanted to. He had no intentions or whatsoever of forfeiting his relationship with Camilla, so what he wanted was a beautiful, shy young bride who would do his bidding, produce children and turn the other way. She turned out to be a woman of her generation who was not going to put up with her husband having a mistress, and it drove her off the rails.
One of the most intriguing things about the Diana story is to watch her slowly realize and become aware of the effect that she's having on other people. Look at her dress, look at her costumes. They start to become more adventurous, they start to become more exciting, more charismatic. The palace had never experienced anything like the Diana phenomenon before. Diana overshadowed everything and everyone, and she knew it. Charles had spent a lifetime shaking hands with people, and there was a sort of blank wall between him and the people he was shaking hands with. But with Diana, this was all new. This was very exciting to go out and meet people. And of course, there was a sort of rush of adrenaline every time she stepped out of a car. The Union Jacks would wave, people would scream and shout. And for a girl who's barely 20, this was a tremendous drug. For all his life, Charles had been number one, fated and cheered wherever he went. Now the public groaned when he went to their side of the street. Charles bitterly resented uh, Diana's public appeal. She would be out with the crowd, they would adore her, they would absolutely uh, scream and shout for her. And it would take a saint not to feel resentful that uh, she was getting this kind of acclaim while he himself was being virtually ignored. Public adoration hit new heights in November 82, when the nation was told Diana was pregnant. But it wasn't to be a happy nine months. Diana was conscious by now that Charles was seeing Camilla, talking to Camilla, uh, that there was a conspiracy going on, and this really is what I think that Diana hated more than anything. He was the one who was going to save her. This was going to be the happy ever after fairy tale of, of all the romance novels that she was reading. So for her to find out that Prince Charles was having an affair with Camilla is another earth-shattering blow to this illusion, this fantasy that she really held for herself. Then on the 20th of June, 1982, with Charles by her side, Diana gave birth to a seven and a half pound boy, the future King of England. The Queen's first comment was, thank goodness he hasn't got ears like his father. They were both of them absolutely delighted with the birth of Prince William. From Diana's point of view, it cemented the relationship, she thought, because that was something that Camilla could never give Charles. From Charles's point of view, he had done his duty, but he has always been very fond of Prince William and later on Prince Harry as well. The baby William was to see little of his parents as they continued with their punishing schedule of public duties. In March 83, a five-week tour to Australia was a huge success for Diana. She had become a megastar, bigger than any film star in the world, bigger than any other monarch in the world. The palace was scared of Diana. They were appalled at the world reaction to her, that every magazine from, uh, from London to Timbuktu was covered with her photograph. There was nothing that they could do to stop this extraordinary uh, forest fire of, of publicity. In Australia, Diana had Charles to herself and she was happy. Back home though, Diana had less of a hold over her husband. She really went to pieces uh, and she was finding it very, very difficult to cope. Charles couldn't handle it. Charles couldn't cope with her. He didn't know where to turn, what to do. Charles, of course, turned to Camilla and the offer of a sympathetic ear and a warm bed.
I think she was very lonely throughout that time, that none of these people could really make up for the loss of what she'd wanted, which was the fa happy family unit she'd been deprived of in childhood and be had become her dream. Diana got her happy family when Prince Harry was born on the 12th of September 1984, but she lost her husband. I think the birth of Harry was the beginning of the end. Yes, it was. Definitely, because I don't think she and Charles ha ha sort of behaved as husband and wife after that. One of the pressures on Charles to marry was purely to breed a male heir to the throne, preferably two, so that uh, there is what they call an heir and a spare. Uh, again, Diana performed this function with terrific dispatch and efficiency and was, in effect, the perfect royal wife, laid on two sons within a matter of years. Psychologically for Charles, maybe he thought, well, she served her purpose. Um, many people have seen Diana simply as a brood mare. Um, I'll now get, get on with my life, and getting on with his life meant Camilla Parker Bowles. In retaliation, Diana surrounded herself with handsome men who paid her compliments and boosted her self-esteem. She hoped it might prompt Charles into action and maybe save the fairy tale. Diana really had appalling taste in men. Uh, she chose people who possibly could be father figures to her. They had to be strong, manly, and besotted by her. But of course, the moment they did become besotted by her, um, she fled. Diana was very, very vulnerable to the charms of, of men who were going to say, oh, I'll look after you, Diana. Don't worry. Everything will be fine. I will be the one who is there for you, or who will be there for you. And I think what she found, although that was very appealing, was that a lot of those men really didn't want to protect her in the way that she needed to be protected, but just wanted to be affiliated with the Princess of Wales. Her greatest love at the time was Captain James Hewitt. James Hewitt was dashingly handsome. He was beautifully dressed, impeccably mannered. He may not have been the uh, sharpest tool in the box, but he certainly passed muster for uh, Diana's needs at that time. From Diana's point of view, it was what must have been a most exciting and intoxicating relationship. The kind of relationship that Diana should have had ten years before she married Prince Charles. A relationship that was based undoubtedly on mutual physical attraction. Uh, they got on well together, they laughed together. Hewitt gave Diana affection, sympathy and some physical intimacy. She gave him another conquest. They used each other. There was little the palace could do. Of course Charles knew, because, and of course the palace knew exactly what was happening, because the, the detectives would always escort wherever she went, and they, of course, had a duty to report back. She knew that they knew. Diana taunted them. She even invited Hewitt to Charles' 40th birthday party at Buckingham Palace in November 1988. Meanwhile, in public at least, the fairy tales struggled on. The Buckingham Palace press machine kept up this fiction that the marriage was fine. It was wishful thinking. They hoped that Diana, in their words, would come to her senses and learn to put up with a husband whose love and affection was elsewhere. As far as Diana was concerned, however, coming to her senses meant humiliating Charles at every opportunity. I saw an example of it for myself in Australia, um, at the Bicentennial of Australia, where Charles went back to his old school, Geelong Grammar School, and was reluctantly persuaded to play the cello. And in the middle of this, she walked right across between him and the cameras and sat down at the piano and started playing Rachmaninoff's second piano concerto. Not badly, actually, but it was an astonishing thing to watch at the time, because all the cameras, of course, swung onto her. And I remember one of the photographers telling me that she, her skirt was an inch shorter than it had been the day before. She was making sure the cameras pointed at her. When Diana threw herself into her charities, she knew, by cleverly concentrating on causes others in the firm would not consider, like AIDS, the cameras would point at her even more. 
Princess Diane had a tremendous impact on the whole cause of HIV and AIDS. From the first time that she visited an AIDS ward in London, when she touched or held the hand of one of the patients there, which had tremendous reverberations all over the world, this was the first time someone who is in a public position had been seen touching someone with HIV, and immediately the picture that went around the world demystified the fact that you can contract HIV by touching someone. In 1990, Diana summoned the strength to confront her two demons. She consulted an eating disorder specialist, and after six months' treatment, the bulimia that had plagued her for years was brought under control. With that conquered, Diana felt confident enough to confront her second demon, Camilla. Annabel Goldsmith gave a 40th birthday party for Annabel Elliot, Camilla's sister, and Charles was invited, and I think Diana said, I'm coming with you. And um, she cornered Camilla very bravely and said, I know exactly what you're doing with my husband and I want you to stop. With the marriage at an all-time low, an unexpected event united Charles and Diana briefly. William was hurt in a school sports accident. One of his uh, fellow pupils hit him over the head with the golf club. I mean, literally just above the eye. So it was very serious and he was rushed to hospital. And Diana was immediately uh, at his side. A scan revealed the need for surgery, but as William was wheeled into theatre with Diana by his side, duty called. Charles disappeared to a different theatre. Charles looked in and then went to the opera and the next day went off to Yorkshire on some Euro mission. The tabloids gave him hell, a lot of commentators gave him hell. She, which she was very good at, milked it. She didn't need to say anything. I think probably the truth of it was that Diana didn't want him anywhere near her. She wanted to be the one there with William. Everything came to a head in 1992. Diana had had enough of her unfaithful husband. Charles had had enough of his neurotic wife. And the public had had enough of the lie. The fairy tale was about to become a nightmare. Courtiers lied and bullied and prevaricated. They used whatever influence they could with editors and proprietors of newspapers uh, to keep this myth alive that Charles and Diana were together and would remain together. But it wasn't true, it was never true, and it was, the whole thing was a hollow sham. We would all know how hollow a sham the marriage was all too soon. The Spencers have always been good haters. And when Diana was marginalised and put in an outsider position, she was not going to suffer that in silence. What were the weapons she had to hand? Well, she didn't have Buckingham Palace, she didn't have the forces of the establishment. All she had was what she knew best, the power of the media. Her strategy was to publish and be damned. Using a go-between, Andrew Morton wrote the book that would change their respective lives forever. The Morton book was her Exocet missile. She wanted to take down the entire House of Windsor. The effect of Andrew Morton's book was absolutely enormous. It stripped the veil away from the machinations of Buckingham Palace. It stripped away the mystique, and it actually showed the Windsors as a very unhappy and troubled, tormented, dysfunctional family. She wanted to appeal to the crowd, the people who actually have supported her in the past, the, the public, the masses. She wanted to appeal to them for sympathy, but also demonstrate that, hey, I'm unhappy and I don't know what to do about this. The book, though, was only Diana's interpretation of events. All the stories about the various suicides were absolute, total nonsense. Totally and completely untrue. She never tried to suicide. You don't run into a mirror to commit suicide, do you? And, but you, they, yet we now know all this didn't come from Morton, but it came from her through the good doctor, the go-between. Now, why would she go out of her way to do that? The only reason, there were two reasons. One, to get the world on her side, and B, to be as vicious as possible to Charles. On the 16th of June, 1992, the book hit the shops. Diana immediately distanced herself from Morton, but the palace was suspicious. She did that famous thing of staging a little photo call at her friend Caroline Bartholomew's house, 
because Bartholomew was known to be one of the sources for the book, uh, giving her a kiss to show no hard feelings, you've helped get my story out. I want the world to know that uh, the palace machine is telling lies. This is what really happened, was what she was saying at the time. The royal family was not amused. I just think they felt it was the most undignified thing that anyone could do, was to tell a journalist, or, or indeed tell anyone outside the family, about your private life, and, and in such a slanted way, too. The palace launched a counterattack. In August 92, a transcript of a phone conversation Diana had had with James Gilby was published in The Sun. The squidgy tapes had been known about for some time. I don't believe that some retired bank manager in his garden shed happened to pick it up. I do believe the uh, secret services were involved in that. Uh, it was much more the timing of its release. Diana was winning the public relations war, and it was at a critical juncture to do with the Morton book that the tape was released to discredit Diana. I thought Diana would never survive that, especially when I knew the entire contents of the tape. Of course, they were doctored at first, and the, the, uh, the most scandalous bits were edited out to save Diana's face. But eventually, it did all come out. A few months later, it was Charles' turn to be humiliated. Camilla Gate. Charles wanted to live inside your trousers. Camilla said loving Charles was easier than falling off a chair. The timing of it was significant in that it helped Diana. Um, and the newspapers on the whole sold more newspapers by being on Diana's side than by being on Charles's side. Uh, it was an absolutely astonishing document, if that's the right word, in that it showed that Charles was capable of love. It is announced from Buckingham Palace that with regret, the Prince and Princess of Wales have decided to separate. Their Royal Highness... The damage was too much. The facade shattered the fairy tale over. I think the royals always knew they'd win in the end, uh, which they always would and have. Um, I think they couldn't believe how effective Diana was being without any support system at all. Diana, alone against the machine, asked her brother Charles if she and the boys could stay in a cottage on the Althorpe estate away from the paparazzi in the palace. The request was turned down. Too much hassle with security. Diana was thrown back to the lions. And the lions tried to tear her to pieces. They had their own dirty tricks department and their propaganda department even in those days to discredit not just her, by putting it out that she was mentally unstable, but people like me who were uh, championing her and had abandoned the Prince of Wales uh, for reasons that we advanced at the time. The press was fed a regular diet throughout 1993 and 94 of Diana refusing Charles access to the children, of Diana being irrational and hysterical. The prince's friends were calling the press with tales of Diana's madness. The palace propaganda machine was during that period playing a lot of dirty tricks, symbolic things that mattered like stopping foreign countries playing the national anthem when Diana arrived, things that, little, little petty irritants. There was little Diana could do in retaliation, but she didn't need to. On the 29th of June, 1994, Charles fluffed his lines again. He commissioned uh, what was regarded as a serious, responsible journalist, Jonathan Dimbleby, to do not just a very long television film, but an immensely long book, putting Charles's case. But of course, the only moment that people remembered was when Charles admitted adultery with Camilla Parker Bowles. That was a, a, an absolute disaster for him, um, because at a stroke, it meant that everything that Diana had done uh, was forgiven by the general public, uh, and more of the public's anger descended on, on Charles's head. He thought he was being modern and, uh, and with it, etc. He wasn't, he was being stupid. Sensing victory, Diana in secret recorded her own television confessional. 
Charles must have been infuriated to see Diana doing her interview on Panorama, confessing adultery, only to see that uh, the British public opinion came round behind Diana, whereas uh, he had been pilloried when he had confessed adultery himself. Do you think Mrs Parker Bowles was a factor in the breakdown of your marriage? Well, there were three of us in this marriage, so it was a bit crowded. From what I understand, far from being a, a, an off-the-cuff sudden decision by the, Diana, A, she considered doing it over many weeks, many weeks. <clears throat> B, uh, understandably, she wanted to see uh, all the questions that were being asked. And before she answered any of the questions, they went through it and she would take advice. Um, and it, it didn't, wasn't all over in an hour or so that we saw on, 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 on the programme, um, but it took three days to shoot. Yes, I was. I think Diana, when she appeared on the Panorama programme, was jet-propelled with anger, frustration and a desire to finally see the whole thing laid out in public. And if you look at her, you see there's too much makeup, there's too much, um, there's too much angst, uh, the tears are brimming. She's really enjoying this diva performance. It was possibly her greatest performance. The battle might have been won, but not the war. Things had got to such a pretty state of affairs that the Queen realised that the only way forward was for the royal family to ditch Diana because of the embarrassment that she was causing. Diana reluctantly agreed to a divorce. Terms included a 17 million lump sum for Diana, Charles would be responsible for the children's education, holidays, clothes and medical needs. Custody would be shared equally. They hoped that by exiling her from the royal family, um, they would be able to slowly but surely push her to one side. Once again, Diana proved impossible to push to one side. The palace's most notable move, and to some most petty, was to take from Diana her title, HRH. She would be simply Diana, Princess of Wales. By casting Diana out into the wilderness, by depriving her of the title HRH, which meant in theory she had to curtsy when her sons came into the room, that somehow people would regard her now as a leper, as beyond the pale. But that's not how it worked. They totally misunderstood public opinion. Instead, people identify with Diana the martyr. I understood the media might be interested in what I did. To the palace's delight, Diana decided to take a step back from public life. 
At an emotional charity function, she announced she would be dropping most of her public duties. But the palace, once again, miscalculated. When she made that speech about withdrawing from public life, she was going to keep up with some of the charities, but I think she realised that she must not spread herself too thinly. That in other words, if she was involved in too many charitable enterprises, people might start to get fed up with it. So she was rationing her appearances to put up the scarcity value. Diana was tremendously clever at picking um, evocative subjects. Um, and whether it be AIDS or landmines, uh, she would attract public attention to it like iron filings to a magnet. Princess Diana made a real difference in terms of landmines. The politicians had been avoiding the issue while pretending to deal with it for years. And one of the best ways to, uh, to explain how she made a difference was for uh, six or seven years, we'd been able to get stories about landmines in The Guardian, maybe in The Telegraph. Um, we couldn't get the Mirror or the Sun or any of those papers to even be remotely interested. Um, within a day of Diana arriving in Angola, uh, the landmines issue was on the front of every one of those papers, plus uh, similar papers all over the world. As well as grabbing the headlines for landmines, Diana also made the front pages with her boyfriends. One man in particular caught the imagination of the press. Dodi al Fayed. Well, Dodi was a very attractive man, and he was sort of like a firebolt. I mean, he showered Diana with gifts, he treated her superbly, but above all, he had time for her. Dodi Fayed had access to as much money as he needed, to private planes and helicopters, to houses in the south of France. He was able to provide her with a very much more glamorous lifestyle than Prince Charles had ever been able to do with his dull holidays in rain-sodden Balmoral. One of the many gifts Dodie bought Diana was a ring. Diana might have just suddenly decided to really annoy everyone to go up and marry Dodie. It is possible. But she said no to all her friends, she said no. She said about Dodie that, um, I've been married to a man who's controlled by his mother. I don't want to be married to another who's controlled by his father. It is more likely that Diana was in love with the freedom, the lifestyle, and the opportunity to upset the palace. And then, suddenly, the fairy tale ended. The palace heaved a sigh of relief. There was this unending problem that was never going to get better, suddenly removed. Charles felt grief-stricken. He felt that, in a way, it was his fault that it had happened at all. The Queen felt grief-stricken for the children and for what might have been. The nation was stunned, but for the royal family, it was business as usual. As television stations ditched their schedules and devoted the day to news of Diana's death, the Queen went to church and heard a sermon entitled Moving House. 500 miles away, cocooned in Balmoral, the firm seemed a million miles away from public opinion. By staying up at Balmoral, the Queen gave the impression she didn't, quote, care about the nation's grief or indeed Diana, which may or may not have been true. They're the most cold people on this earth. The way they left her out and she was just mistreated by them. The people everywhere, not just here in Britain, everywhere, they kept faith with Princess Diana. They liked her, they loved her. They regarded her as one of the people Occupying the considerable minds of the royal elite was her funeral. The Queen and Philip wanted a private ceremony for Diana. They wanted to bury this woman as fast as they possibly could, as obscurely as they possibly could. And uh, every action that was taken between her death and her funeral was fueled by, in my view, malice and a determination to see her reputation buried with her. But CBS reporter Bill McLaughlin warned, if it isn't a state funeral, a crowd of several hundred thousand people will invade Buckingham Palace and tear the royal family apart. Prince Charles realized that the shabby treatment of Diana in death was a threat to the Windsors. He was the one who argued that she needed to be given a proper royal, a proper state funeral. He was the one who said, unless we bring back Diana's 
body in a proper manner, she's going to come back in the, uh, the back of a, a Harrods van driven by Mohammed Fayed. Charles won. Diana was allowed her final show. It was during the funeral that the public vented their anger over the way they thought Diana had been treated. I know that when Prince Charles walked behind the cortege, he could hear all the voices in the crowd. Remember, I said it was so quiet. And he could hear people saying, you know, he thought that he wouldn't make it to the church. He thought someone would try and shoot him. It was that unpleasant. And he'd actually writ made, uh, written a letter in case anything had happened. He was, he, he was very aware of the unpleasant feeling, the feelings against him, the feelings against the monarchy, the feelings against his family. Life is meant to begin at 40. Diana had already lived a lifetime by the time she was 37. What would she have accomplished if she had lived? I think she would have achieved her wish of slipping out of public life as long as she had a private life to go to. She would have been a terrific mother to those children. She would have stopped causing trouble for Prince Charles. The monarchy would have sailed on as it would, whatever happened. Were she still to be with us today, I think she would be an uncomfortable woman, an unhappy woman, a woman still searching for a role in life, trying very hard to tread the world stage, but with people becoming gradually more disillusioned with her. Her legacy was one of destroying or undermining much of the old stiff etiquette and royal protocol of trying to bring the royal family down to the people. Now whether that in the long term is a good strategy for the royal family, that remains to be seen. <laughs> <laughs>